Welcome to Galesville United Methodist Church service for August the 2nd, 2020. We hope all is well with you, and we hope all of you are safe and in God's hands. We have some announcements. The only announcement I have this morning is that we are continuing to collect um, school supplies, the boxes in the back of the sanctuary, and uh, we're still working on a creative way to distribute them um, since school is, is virtual this time. So bring them in. All of the things can be used. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's Dave Loftus again, and you know what I've got for you. More birthdays and anniversaries. Um, actually, we have no anniversaries again this week, but we do have several birthdays. Buck Hudson, Judy Silcox, Randy Sir, and Joe Seymour. So let's sing happy birthday to all of them. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jesus loves you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, that's all for this week, but see you next time for more birthdays and anniversaries. Would you please join me in the call to worship? Even in the middle of summer, our hearts can be burdened. Stress and worry do not seem to take vacations. You have come to a special time where you can find relief and healing. Thanks, Thanks be to God for providing us with such blessings. Come, prepare your hearts to receive God's gracious gift of love. We open our hearts and spirits and She has surgery, and um, hopefully I'll be sending an email letting you know how she, how she did with that. Uh, Robert in need of a heart transplant, and we continue to play, pray for the Frame family, and, um, and Major Ben Horton, who is still serving our country over, overseas. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, 
We are filled with a mixture of feelings today. Some of us are rejoicing in the wonderful time of rest and relaxation, while others continue to seek relief from the burdens and worries that they bear. All of us stand in need of your refreshing and nourishing love and forgiveness. You know how many times we have turned our backs on those in need. We have been too busy, too preoccupied with our own problems. Cause us to turn around and see instances in which we can be of help and comfort to someone else. Give us strength and courage to truly be your loving disciples in the ways in which we care for others. Forgive us when we stray from the paths of righteousness and peace. Lord, be with the family of Jean Trot, with Robin and Allison and Tracy and Shirley, with Robert and his family and with the Frame family. And Lord, bless all those serving our country around the world, especially Major Ben Thornton. And be with all those that are serving here as our medical personnel, our first responders, our essential personnel. As we have brought our prayers before you and for those near and dear to us seeking healing and hope for them, let us also remember that those same mercies are lavished upon us, not because we deserve them, but because of your great and generous love for us. Help us receive these blessings and in turn be a blessing to someone else. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior, who taught us to say as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today we're going to talk about the story of Joseph, you know, the son of Jacob the one who had the coat of many, many colors. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you out there have a younger brother or sister? Now you've created this family or been in this family and you've kind of got your parents trained and all of a sudden this younger brother or sister comes along and upsets the whole apple cart. What are you going to do? The sign says, Brother for Sale. Are you ready to sell this intruder to the highest bidder? Well, you know something? That's exactly what happened to Joseph. See, Joseph had ten older brothers who were tired of his bragging and tired of their father's obvious favoritism towards him. And truth is, Joseph was probably a bit obnoxious and probably deserved their, their ill feelings towards him. So, one day, when they were out tending the flocks and tending the sheep, they sold him. They sold him to some traders who were coming down through there, who then took him to Egypt and sold him to somebody who worked in the, in the Pharaoh's palace. Well, it was there that, that Joseph began to grow up, and he was actually doing pretty well for himself, but then he was unfairly thrown into prison. Now, probably thrown into prison because he was a bit, bit too good looking, maybe. But in, he was forgotten in prison. He stayed there for a long time. But in that time in prison, he decided that he began to recognize some of the gifts that God had given him. And one of those was the interpretation of dreams. And eventually, the Pharaoh heard about Joseph's gift of interpretation because he had a very strange dream that he just couldn't figure out. He had a dream that for seven years there was going to be these big fat cows that came out of the stream. And then seven years, there were these terrible, thin-looking, emaciated cows. And he sent for Joseph to ask him what this meant. 
Well, Joseph correctly interpreted that Egypt was going to experience a time of great wealth in terms of lots of food and bountiful harvests. And then there was going to be seven years of famine when the harvests weren't good and there wasn't going to be enough food to serve to, to feed everybody. So the king put Joseph in charge of managing the crops in the bountiful years so there would be plenty of crops and food for people in the years that were really lean. And it was during those lean years that Joseph was actually reunited with his 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 family. They came down searching for food and, and Joseph recognized them and after a while they, they recognized each other and he was able to reunite and specially reunite with his father. Now what Joseph learned during this time and especially during his time in prison is that you know you don't always get to control the situation around you. We might feel like this pandemic is controlling us but we can always control how we react to things. That's what Joseph learned. He was always looking for the positive. He was always looking for ways then to be able to do good. When we recognize that God has given us certain gifts and in any situation we can use those gifts for good. And in the midst of that also we can also recognize that in any situation whether it be bad or good we can have the opportunity to deepen our relationship with God. So that was the lesson that Joseph learned, and I hope that you'll you'll think about that some too. No matter what happens to you, whether it's bad or good, you choose how you're going to react. Amen. <laughs>
and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he described it to his father and brothers, his father scolded him and said to him, What kind of dreams have you dreamed? Am I and your mother and your brothers supposed to come and bow down to the ground in front of you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father took careful note of the matter. Joseph's brothers went to tend their father's flocks near Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Aren't your brothers tending the sheep near Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. And he said, I'm ready. Jacob said to him, Go, find out how your brothers are and how the flock is, and report back to me. So Jacob sent him from the Hebron Valley. When he approached Shechem, a man found him wandering in the field and asked him, What are you looking for? Joseph said, I'm looking for my brothers. Tell me, where are they tending the sheep? The man said, they left here. I heard them saying, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. They saw Joseph in the distance before he got close to them, and they plotted to kill him. The brothers said to each other, here comes the big dreamer. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and we'll say a wild animal devoured him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard what they said, he saved him from them telling them, let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, don't spill his blood, throw him into the desert cistern, but don't lay a hand on him. He intended to save Joseph from them and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped off Joseph long robe, took him and threw him into the cistern, an empty cistern with no water in it. When they sat down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with camels carrying sweet resin, medicinal resin, and fragrant resin on their way down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and hide his blood? Come on. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not harm him because he's our brother. He's family. His brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph to Egypt. The second reading is taken from the 14th chapter of Matthew, verses 13 to 21. When Jesus heard about John, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. When the crowds learned this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion for them and healed those who were sick. That evening, his disciples came and said to him, This is an isolated place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, There's no need to send them away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here except five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the loaves apart and gave them to his disciples. Then the disciples gave them to the crowds. Everyone ate until they were full, and they filled 12 baskets with the leftovers. About 5,000 men plus women and children had eaten. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Continuing our theme on finding God in family-friendly movies, we come to Disney's Cinderella. The story of Cinderella holds an enduring place in the hearts of children of every age. The story, as we know it, is based on Charles Perrault's late 17th century version, complete with stepmother and fairy godmother and mice and pumpkin and glass slipper and rescuing prince. It was Perrault's story that received the Disney treatment in 1950. The creativity of the Disney studio was on full display, and the film earned three Academy Awards, including Best Song for Bippity Boppity Boo. There is much in the story that's familiar to us. Even if we've never heard the story or watched the movie, we sort of know the basic outline of this story. A pressed girl finds a new life and is lifted from her condition by a handsome prince. We've heard this one before. Why should this story attract us? What is there about it that cuts through the major differences of time and place and culture? There are other attractive heroines. There are other cruel stepmothers and ugly sisters to bring alive the perils of family life. Rescuing princes abound and other godmothers or talking animals exist in the world of fairy tales. What is there about the story of Cinderella that so attracts us? It's Cinderella herself. Seated in her ashes, her cinders, she reminds us of all those who suffer perhaps even reminding us of a suffering servant that Isaiah wrote about. She is a victim, a victim of injustice, a victim of cruelty, and a victim of maltreatment, and serves harsh and pitiless superiors. She's a victim of envy, that most dangerous of human emotions and behaviors. She is squashed by the envy of her stepmother, and stepsisters. The story of Cinderella begins with the background we need to put it all together. Cinderella is the only child of a wealthy father and a deceased mother. The father dotes on Cinderella, giving her everything she needed or wanted. Still, the father feels that what Cinderella really needs is a mother. So in time, the father remarries a woman with two daughters. As fate would have it, the father dies, leaving Cinderella with her new family, who it turns out are far worse than anyone could have known. Cinderella is treated as a slave and forced to live in rags and sit in the cinders. What was the cause of Cinderella's mistreatment? Envy. What was there to be envious of? Cinderella's beauty, her poise, her sense of self and her inheritance. Cinderella had it all, and the stepsisters could not compare. Envy presents itself as feeling demeanored by another's good fortune and wanting to belittle the other's good to protect oneself. Envy looks hard for evil in another person and takes great satisfaction in finding it. Envy wears many masks. Among them, jealousy, greed, resentment, covetedness, and spite. And because the Bible is a very human book, telling stories of very human people, we shouldn't be surprised to find envy in its pages. Rachel was jealous of Leah for, being, for not being able, no, for being able to provide children to Jacob. And the psalmist advises us to steer clear of envy. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Then the editor of Proverbs reminds us 
A tranquil mind gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. And then when you make the jump to the New Testament, it is envy and jealousy that are given as reasons for the crucifixion of Jesus by those opposed to him. There is no greater example of envy and jealousy in the Bible than the story of Joseph and his brothers. We heard the opening story this morning. Joseph, the dreamer, is the favorite son of Jacob. Jacob dotes on him and gives him more attention than he gives his other sons. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Jacob had 12 sons and one daughter. Leah, his first wife, bore him six sons and a daughter. Rachel, Jacob's favorite wife, was unable to bear children and gave her servant Bilhah to be a surrogate for her. Bilhah bore two more sons. Leah gave her servant Zilpah to Jacob as a surrogate and she bore two sons. And finally, Rachel bears Jacob two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, the favorite of sons of a favorite wife. Lots of intrigue, lots of scheming, lots of maneuvering. So when you stop to think about it, Joseph's stepbrothers are the ones who are being envious of him and sell him into slavery and then create a fantastic tale about what happened to him and being killed by wild animals. And why? Because they are jealous, envious, and resentful of him. The Bible pulls no punches when it comes to envy. The Bible puts envy on display for all to see its destructive and vicious power. The Bible offers us these images as warning and counsel. Envy leads us to see something in, a, in another that we find missing in ourselves and then act out against the one who has what we want. Envy blinds us to the blessings that surround us. Envy gets into our thoughts and feelings. It erodes our love for neighbor and eventually our love for God. Why would God bless them so when they are such despicable people? It would serve them right if God would just smash them. These words roam around in our brains and sometimes come out of our mouths and into our actions. We strike out at those who are the objects of our envy. We speak ill of them, gossip about them, pass judgments on them, all because we see something in them that we find absent in ourselves. And rather than try to change ourselves, we try to tear down another. So where are we gonna go for help and hope? To whom can we turn? Cinderella is there in the cinders. She sits in the ashes. She offers a feminine face to the suffering servant of Isaiah's prophecy. Instead of envy and jealousy, she offers us a glimpse of humility and meekness. She is unassuming and modest. She is true to herself and grateful for what is hers and not another's. In her humility, and lowliness, there is greatness and distinction. She accepts the maltreatment she receives and does not return it to them from whom it came. Cinderella offers us a glimpse of Christ and a glimpse of how those who would be known as Christians are to live. She is the opposite of envy and jealousy. She's grateful and thankful for what she has. She seeks not for things, but for love. She strives not for more, but for what is real and lasting and true. And it's for that that Cinderella is rewarded. For living, for living a humble and authentic life, Cinderella receives the gift for which she longs, love. Cinderella finds new life. Envy, jealousy, and covetedness will destroy us. Humility, modesty, and unassuming natures, these will lead us to life. These are reflections of the Creator. Unless you think that this is just too much, 
Remember these words from Psalm 113. The Lord takes up the weak out of the dust and lifts up the poor from the cinders. The Lord sets them with nobles, with nobles of the chosen people. And if we make the change, if we can put away the ways of jealousy and envy and take up the ways of humility and generosity, we too can live happily ever after, which is, of course, just another way of saying now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. <laughs>